He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son does not have life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Because we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ. Even so, we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Before we open God's word together this morning, let's bow our heads together and ask God to direct our thinking, help us to focus and concentrate and understand the things that he has to teach us this morning. Our Father, we're thankful so much for your word that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. It illuminates our thinking to us, helps us to understand who we are and what you expect of us and how we as believers should live. Knowing that if there is someone listening that is not a believer, that the issue is not so much what we are teaching today other than the gospel. The issue is faith in Christ alone. For as a non-believer, we cannot live as you would have us. It is necessary for us to have new life, spiritual life, and be led by and directed by God the Holy Spirit in your word. Father, we thank you that we have your word. We thank you that we can come to understand who Jesus is, what he came to do at the first coming, what he will come to do at the second coming, and why he delays even now before he returns. And we pray as we study these things that you would illuminate our minds. In Christ's name, amen. Open your Bibles with me to Mark. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. We won't get there for a while. We're addressing the question in our study on Ephesians as to why the ascension of Christ We'll be looking at several passages this morning that are the parallel passages that describe the ascension itself, beginning with the passage in Mark chapter uh, 16. But we recognize that today is the Sunday before Christmas of 2019. We live in a world that is in tremendous turmoil. That is not something new. I know there are a lot of people who don't understand much about history, but we have had a time in the world of relative stability and uh, peace for the last 50 or 60 years, although if you really analyze the number of wars and police actions and revolts and rebellions, I think there's something like one or two a week over the average of the last 60 years. But in terms of the worldwide conflagrations that were experienced early in the 20th century, we haven't truly seen that. But today we live in a time when more governments are in significant turmoil than we have seen before. We, of course, can think of some of the nations such as Venezuela and Chile, Bolivia, that are in real chaos. Venezuela is just in a total meltdown due to socialism and totalitarianism. And we need to pray for the believers that are there. Recently, Brett Nasworth was down there having a, a conference with Christian leaders in Venezuela. He was, they were meeting uh, across the border. And they were just so glad to get anything to eat. That it is so difficult to find food, to be able to eat, and they're constantly in hunger. But the believers that are there have tremendous opportunity to witness. But we see many nations like that that are in trouble. We see the demonstrations that are going on in Hong Kong, which have been going on since the early summer. Adding to that, we have major nations 
such as Britain that's been going through all this turmoil with Brexit, and even though they had what appears to be an election that would lead to some resolution, who knows if that will actually happen. Israel has been in gridlock politically since the election last year. They're going to have another election, but until they can resolve uh, who the government will be, uh, they're, just, they're just locked down. And of course, here in the U.S., we have a president who has this last week been impeached by the House of Representatives. The world is in a panic over the possibility of other disasters. Those who uh, <coughs> espouse a global warming have moved from global warming to climate change, and now the language is more histrionic, and they constantly talk about a global disaster, and hardly a day goes by that we don't hear that that the world is going to be gone within another uh, 10 or 12 years. I was talking with someone yesterday, a member of the church, member of the congregation who travels a lot, and relayed to me a conversation he overheard. Young couple, the husband said, well, they were going on a trip for the holidays. Husband made some comment about being able to, hoping that they could find their car when they returned. And the wife, in all seriousness, not joking at all, said, well, we may all be vaporized by then. And uh, even though some of us chuckle at that, there are many people who live in dread and fear. They don't have the truth. They don't understand the gospel. They don't know that God is in control. And they have believed the lie of evolution, the lies of atheism, and there really is a deep dread in their souls about the fact that everything could be gone tomorrow and they don't know what to do about it. There is this anticipation of an apocalyptic disaster, maybe economic, perhaps political, maybe an asteroid will collide with the earth and everything will change and almost everyone die. And of course there's the global uh, global warming and global disaster from meteorology. It wasn't much different in the first century. The extent of the problems and the disasters was somewhat different, but there was an apocalyptic expectation, not just in Israel, but of course we know about the Magi coming from the Parthian Empire, and they had been watching the calendar and counting the years to the appearance of the Messiah, there was a, an incredible sense of messianic expectation in Judea and among the Jews. And even in other pagan cultures, there was a sense that something was about to happen. We know that uh, God was working. Galatians 4.4 4 says that Christ appeared uh, in the fullness of times. And even so, we know that the Messiah was born. And we had great hope. The Messiah came, as we've studied, to offer the kingdom. John the Baptist announced that the king was coming and that people need to repent for the kingdom of heaven was at hand, meaning it was near. When Jesus came, he had the same message. When he sent out the disciples at first, he sent them only to the house of Israel and the house of Judah with that same message to repent for the kingdom of heaven uh, was at hand. But as we have studied, what happened was he was rejected, that his own people did not receive him. His own people rejected him and eventually had him arrested and crucified. He was then buried, but on the third day he rose from the dead. He conquered sin. He had paid the price uh, for sin at the cross and he conquered death in his resurrection. But what about the kingdom? What about these prophecies that, about the Messiah that were yet unfulfilled? There were over a hundred different prophecies of the Messiah that were f fulfilled in the first coming. If you talk to a Jewish person, they ignore that and they say, well, what about all these others? They still have the problem of wanting to put the crown before the cross not understanding the, what the scriptures teach about a suffering Messiah. Jesus came, he paid for sin, he was crucified. On the third day he rose from the dead 
And then 40 days later, he left. No kingdom. That was indeed the last question as we studied that the disciples asked was, is it now that you are going to restore the kingdom? So the question that we're addressing is, why did he leave? And what is he going to do now? Ultimately, when we think about the instability in the world at that time and the instability today, we want to ask the question, well, what is he waiting for? What is going on right now? What is being accomplished in God's plan with the Son at his right hand? What is he waiting for? And so this is what we're learning as we take apart this second aspect of, and third aspect of what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 2, 5, and 6. We were made alive together with him in verse 5. We were raised up together with him at the beginning of verse 6. And now we're studying the significance of this phrase, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What is the significance of this session, this seating of Christ at the Father's right hand? Last week I had this set of verses up here on the screen and I said there were at least 14 New Testament verses. I ran across two more today, so now it's at least 16 that I have found. I'm, I'm sure there are more, but these are the ones that are most, most uh, predominantly stated. And so something that is talked about throughout the New Testament is important. It's crucial to understand what is happening today. Why is the Son seated at the right hand of the Father? What is going on? So we're continuing to address this question of what the Bible teaches about the ascension and the session of Christ. And we started last time to look at the background to this, and we understood that when Christ came he came announcing the kingdom again and again. There was that kingdom expectation, but because of the rejection, the kingdom was postponed. And so I raised the question, well, what happened to God's plan when Jesus Christ was rejected and crucified? He didn't change the nature of the kingdom. It didn't become a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom that John the Baptist the kingdom that Jesus, the kingdom that the disciples proclaimed was the same kingdom that had been prophesied and expected from the Old Testament, a literal kingdom on the earth, a geophysical kingdom where you had uh, the Davidic descendant, the Messiah, sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Not some spiritual kingdom where Jesus is in heaven, this is the this is the lie and the distortion of amillennialism, that there's no literal millennium, that it is a spiritual kingdom, and we're in the spiritual kingdom now, and that um, Jesus is ruling from the right hand of the Father. It misses the point completely. Ruling is an active concept. Seating is a passive concept. The, our Lord is in session. He's seated. Now, he is accomplishing certain things in relation to the church, and that's what all of this is about, is what God is doing in this age through the church, and it relates to the significance of all of this. So in Acts 1-6, the disciples ask Jesus, they don't realize he's getting ready to leave them, and they say, well, Lord, is it at this time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They understand it's an a kingdom that is Jewish in nature and that it will be restored, reflecting on the uh, past kingdom of David and Solomon. And so we looked at this last time that there was still confusion. The Jews had expected a one coming Messiah. They had put the, the crown, expecting him to rule, before the cross, not realizing the many prophecies that related to a suffering Messiah who would pay for their sins. And because they put the crown before the cross, they had a complete distortion of and distorted expectation of the future. 
I pointed out that in each of the Gospels, what we have is a similar progression. First, there is the offer of the kingdom. Then there is the rejection of the king and what is called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which was a one-of-a-kind uh, blasphemy. It was rejecting the Messiah and claiming that the miracles he performed came from Satan. It was a generational sin. It was for that generation. And when Jesus announces that they will be uh, condemned because of that, he's not condemning them that they can't ever be justified or saved in the future. What he is saying is that generation will be disciplined by God, and it was in A.D. 70, and they were removed, and Israel uh, was taken out of the land. So you had the rejection of the king, and then he began to teach his disciples by way of parables, and the hostility and rejection continued until they, uh, they crucified him. And then it was 40 days after that, a time in which Jesus is teaching them again and again, telling them about the Holy Spirit. He's teaching about what he is doing, but they, they're, they're dense. They don't get it. So that their last question is still, when's the kingdom coming? And so we must ask this question, why is it postponed? What's the purpose of the ascension and the unforeseen inter-advent age? I pointed out last time that one reason Jesus ascended was so that he could send the Holy Spirit. In John 16, 7, he said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, that is sometimes translated comforter, uh, it's a reference to the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him to you. So one of the first reasons for the ascension is so that there would be this shift and Jesus would go to the right hand of the Father and then he would send the Holy Spirit. So if we go on to read after Acts 1, 6, what Jesus then said to them in answer to their question, is it now that you're going to bring the kingdom Jesus didn't address that per se, but he said, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Now he uses those same Greek terms for times and seasons, or Paul does later in, in 1 Thessalonians, which gives us, where, where uh, Paul says that he has taught them about the times and the seasons. Season. So this wasn't a permanent statement that you're not supposed to know anything about this, but I'm not going to talk about this now. We have to talk about the more important things, and that was what they needed to do immediately. And in verse 8 he said, but you shall receive power from the Holy Spirit, uh, or you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses, or you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So the, uh, what we see here is the ascension is not only connected to sending the Holy Spirit, but the sending and re of the Holy Spirit is tied to being a witness to the work of Christ on the cross uh, throughout the whole world. And that this is part of the plan for today. It's a a significant shift from the previous dispensation. So now what I want to do this morning is to talk about the ascension of Christ in terms of how it is described. So we'll start in Mark 16, the last chapter of Mark, the last two verses in the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 16 is a rather abbreviated ending compared to the uh, information we're given in Matthew and in Luke and in John as to what happens after the, after the resurrection. And it's given in sort of a summary fashion. But in Mark 16, 19, we read, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word 
through the accompanying signs. Amen. Now, in this abbreviated, abridged version, we read about this ascension of Christ, that he's received up into heaven. However, this is not the first ascension after the cross. There is one that is little known and little talked about, but it is described briefly in the Gospel of John. On the morning of Christ's resurrection, Mary Magdalene has gone to the tomb, and there she is, she is weeping. And as she continues to weep, she hears someone call her name. And when she hears this, she assumes it is the gardener, and she thinks that the gardener has stolen the body or moved it somewhere else, and so she demands that the gardener take, him, take her to the body. But at that moment, as Jesus says her name, she realizes who it is, that it is the Lord. And then in John 20, 17, Jesus says to her, somewhat cryptic statement, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But, he instructs her, Go to my brethren and say to them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now what that indicates is that early morning when he is talking to Mary, that he is ascending then. This is 40 days before, quote, the ascension that we're talking about in Acts chapter 1 and in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 16. But it, ha it's a, it has significance. He ascends, and later that day, we know that he returns. So something significant happened in between. And in Luke 24, 38 to 40, it tells us that later that evening, he returned, and he uh, appears to his disciples. And Luke 24, 36, he suddenly appeared in the midst of them and said, Shalom, peace to you. But they were terrified, frightened, thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? And then he shows him his hands, his feet, and he says, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see. So earlier he tells Mary, don't cling to me. Now he says to his disciples, touch me, put your uh, fingers in the, in the nail prints. Something has happened. Now the scripture doesn't really tell us a lot. There's indication from, the, from Hebrews that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he entered the heavenly temple to purify the, the heavenly temple because of his death. But little more is indicated about that from the, uh, from the scripture. And following that ascension, he then returns to the earth and spends a good bit of time during the next 40, 40 days teaching and instructing his disciples as to what to expect in the coming, uh, the coming church age. Now, he then takes them to the Mount of Olives. In Mark 16, 19, and 20, we're not really told where he went or what happened. It just briefly says that after he had spoken to them, he is received up into heaven and he sat down. So he speaks to them. Then he's received up into heaven. And the verb that is there is a verb that shows up again in Acts. It is ana lambano, and it's a third-person aorist passive indicative. The important thing to note is it's passive. Jesus doesn't blast off on his own power. He doesn't take off like Superman uh, flying in, into the cosmos. He is received into heaven. It's a passive verb which indicates his acceptance and that he is taken into heaven. We'll see some other words that describe this, all of which are in the passive voice. Passive voice means that the subject re receives the action of the verb. So he is uh, taken up uh, into heaven, and then he sits down. That's an active voice verb. He sits down at the right hand of the Father. Well, now let's turn to the end of the Gospel of Luke. That Luke is just across the page from uh, Mark 16. So we turn to Luke chapter 24. And there we see Luke's description. 
John doesn't give us a description of the ascension. Luke does here in the Gospel of Luke, and then he reiterates what happens in the first chapter of Acts. So in Luke chapter 24, verse 50, we're told, And he led them out as far as Bethany. Now, they had been staying in Jerusalem, so he's going to cross the Kidron Valley. I'll put the map up here in just a second. Cross the Kidron Valley up onto the Mount of Olives. Now, this is an aerial photograph of Jerusalem. On the left, you see the uh, abomination of the Dome of the Rock, which is on the exact site of the, where the temple was located before. So this is the Temple Mount on the left. And the eastern gate at the time of Herod's temple, Solomon's temple, was under where I have this purple arrow. Then there's a valley that goes to the east of the Temple Mount. And then there is a hill on the other side. The tip of the arrow here is somewhere in the vicinity of the Garden of, Eden, uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And this side over here is the Mount of Olives. And so this is the, generally, they would have taken a route that would have gone down somewhat along where this road is located here. Uh, right here where I'm showing on the arrow, this is where the southern steps to the temple were located, where uh, the gates were located to enter into the temple. And so they would have gone around the temple and walked along the Kidron Valley here and then gone up onto the Mount of Olives. Now that is uh, significant. Bethany is located far off to the right. It was about two miles away on the other side, uh, other opposite slope of the Mount of Olives. And so in verse 50 we read, and he led them out as far as Bethany. So they cross over the crest of the Mount of Olives to where they are near Bethany. And then he lifts up his hands, which is a standard way in which Jews would pronounce a blessing, holding their hands up, and he blessed them. So he is pronouncing a blessing, a prayer for them. And Luke says, and it came to pass while he blessed them. So he is still talking, but as he is speaking, he's moving away from them. That's the first verb we see here. He was parted. From them, And that is a bad translation. It's translated as a passive. It doesn't say that. He parted from them. He's walking away from them. It's the word on the left, dehistemi. It is an aorist active indicative, which means he's moving away. He isn't being taken away. He's moving away from them. And then he is carried up into heaven. The other word was ana. Same prefix, it was on a lambano, this is on a pharaoh, and it's also a passive verb, uh, third person singular, imperfect, passive, indicative. This indicates that he is receiving the action of the verb and he is being uh, taken up or raised up into heaven. That is verse 51. And in verse 52 we read, and they worshiped him, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. So that is what Jesus tells them to do, as we'll see when we get over to Acts 1. So we've looked at Mark, we've looked at Luke, now turn to the just past the Gospel of John and come to Acts chapter 1. Acts, Acts was also written by Luke, who wrote the Gospel to Luke. And we begin to see the description of this day in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commended them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He's told them, as it's related in John 16, that it was necessary for him to leave in order to send the Holy Spirit. So now he is telling them to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. For, and then he talks about, relates this to John the Baptist statement earlier at the beginning of his ministry, where he says, For John truly baptized with water, 
but you shall be baptized, future tense, with the Holy Spirit uh, not many days from now. So he ties this together. At the beginning you heard John say that someone would come after him that would baptize by the Holy Spirit. Now you wait here in Jerusalem and you will be baptized by the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then they asked their question, Lord, is it at this time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. And then he comes to verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Then we have the action, verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things... While they watched, he was taken up. So Mark tells us and Luke tells us that he's blessing them and being parted from them and walking away from them. Now all Luke says is while they watched. So they're watching, they see him walk away, and then he is taken up, and we're told a cloud received him out of their sight. So he, he is taken up, he's received into heaven, and he's received by a cloud. Now that's interesting. You have this cloud description many times in the Old Testament in relation to the presence of God. There are clouds. He comes riding a chariot on the clouds. Clouds are often associated with him, but clouds are also associated with angels. And so this becomes a figure of speech. And I think it is describing an angelic host that is not seen as such, but it is a cloud of angels. And they go as an escort to the Lord Jesus Christ as he is received in this cloud, and then he goes on to heaven. Now the two verbs that we have here is, first of all, he was taken up. This is again a different verb, but it's also in the passive voice. That indicates that he is the receiver of this action. He's not leaving on his own. He is being accepted. He is being brought back to heaven. He was sent from heaven at the first advent. He was sent to the earth, and he was born through the virgin conception and virgin birth. And he was sent on a mission to offer the kingdom. The kingdom's rejected. But his primary mission at the first coming was to die on the cross for our sins. Now he is being accepted back into heaven. So all we're told here in verse 9, he's taken up and a cloud received him. So the cloud performs the action of receiving him. It's an active voice verb. And the cloud, and it literally means to lift up, the cloud lifted him up out of their sight. So as he goes into the cloud, it's as if the, it, the cloud takes him away. Now we'll see a verse in Hebrews that says he goes through the heavens. So this cloud then is taking him through the heavens. But I just want to point one thing out here about the cloud. We won't get there this time. We'll get there in the next lesson. But in Daniel chapter 7, which is in, an important passage for understanding all that is going on here, Daniel has a vision of the end time, just at the, what will be at the end of the tribulation. And he is looking, he sees this vision, he's already seen the vision of the coming human kingdoms and the revived Roman Empire pictured by this incredible beast that has ten horns, the ten uh, nation confederacy that makes up the revived Roman Empire. And then Daniel says, I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. I believe these are the thrones for the 24 elders who represent the church. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels like a burning fire. I think this, this is reminiscent of what we read in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And then there's this description, a river of fire is flowing out, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. These are the angels. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, the books were open. 
And then he says in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. So Jesus now is sitting at the right hand of the Father. That's his position. But when it comes time for him to be given the kingdom, he will come in clouds of heaven to the throne of the Ancient of Days. John is picturing this as the Father is on the throne and there is a scroll and they're looking for someone who is worthy to open the scroll and then the Lamb of God is the one who is found worthy and comes to take the scroll. I think this is all related. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was prevent, presented before him and it's at that time I think this is at the time when, he, when the Lamb takes the scroll in Revelation 4. The scroll is the title deed to planet Earth. That is when the Son of Man is given the title deed to come and take control of the, of the planet. And it's the opening of the seven seals on the scroll that begins the judgments in the tribulation. The seventh seal reveals seven trumpet judgments. The seventh trumpet judgment re reveals seven bowl judgments, and it's at the end that the Lamb on his white horse comes to the earth, defeats the Antichrist and the false prophet. And so he doesn't come to the throne of the Ancient of Days to get the title deed to be given the kingdom until when? Until the, that it is the giving of that and the opening of the first seal that begins the seven years of tribulation. So this again shows we're not in any form of the kingdom. We're not there. The sun is seated waiting for this to happen. And when that time comes, then he will go. He will come before the Ancient of Days. And to him, verse 14, was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So he's waiting until this time, those are two key words. He's waiting until, and I'm going to, I'll bring you back to that in a minute. So in Acts 1.10 we read, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, behold two men stood by them in white apparel. I've always loved this picture. Somebody had a good imagination. They're all, if you can't see it well, what you have at the top center of the picture are just two feet hanging down as Jesus is taking off into heaven, and they're just like, whoa, what just happened? They, you've seen astronauts go into space. You've seen airplanes take off. They've never seen anything like it. And they're just stunned. And then these two angels, these two men, stand next to them, and they say, men of Galilee... Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's taken up. He is raised. Again, it's an aorist passive, but he's going to come back. He's going to come back on the clouds. He's going to come back, and this refers to the end of the tribulation. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is when we look at Jerusalem, and this is a map of Jerusalem, and here you have the Dome of the Rock. This is the Temple Mount. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel has a vision where because of God's judgment on apostate, idolatrous Ju Judah, the kingdom of Judah, uh, in the in their idolatry in the 7th century B.C., He's going to judge them. Before he judges them, and Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 B.C., God leaves. And Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 10, has this vision where he sees the Shekinah, the dwelling of God, move from the Holy of Holies to the east gate, then move from the east gate across the, the uh, Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, and then ascend to heaven. Jesus is generally following that same path with the disciples on that day that he ascended. He's on the Temple Mount, he crosses over the Kidron, goes up on the Mount of Olives, and then ascends to heaven. 
So now what I want to do is just to look briefly in a sense of an overview of what was accomplished, what is being accomplished, or what was accomplished in the ascension. First of all, the ascension validated and certified Christ's prophecy that he would go to the Father. Jesus prophesied his death. He prophesied the manner of his death. And the fact that it happened according to his prophecy indicates that he is a prophet and he was speaking the truth. We speak of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. These prophecies, these predictions he made about himself are part of his role as prophet. The ascension and session have to do with his priesthood, his high priesthood for the church. But he validates... The, the, the ascension itself is a validation of his prophecy, John 14, 20, 28. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So he is prophesying that he's going away and that he will send the Holy Spirit. And so the ascension validates that prophecy. Second thing we saw was the ascension is pictured with passive voice verbs. This indicates that it is God's, God the Father's acceptance and reception of the Son back to glory in heaven. And so he is welcomed back, and the Son ascends through the heavens. And we see this in the passages we just looked at, Mark 16, 19, Luke 24, 51, Acts 1, 2, 9, 11, and 22. He is welcomed back into heaven. A third thing we learn about the ascension is that it's pictured as a rapture. Now you know there are plenty of people who, especially amillennialists, because of their distorted view of the millennium, reject the idea of a rapture, even though it is clearly taught. You will often hear people say, well, the word rapture isn't used anywhere in the Bible. And that is, that is a lie. It's just not the English word rapture isn't used. The Greek word is harpazo, which means to be taken away or to be snatched away. That's the word that's used in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. That's the word uh, harpazo. It was translated into the Latin word uh, rapio, which is where we get our English word rapture. So it is a statement of distortion to say that the word rapture isn't in the Bible. It is, it's just the Latin word. But we also have it in Revelation 12.5. It's also what happens to the two witnesses when they're caught up to be uh, to heaven in the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, Elijah, I mean, excuse me, Enoch in the Old Testament is taken to be with God. So there are different raptures in the Bible. In Revelation 12, 5, we see this, or John has this vision, and there is a woman who is a picture of Israel who goes into the wilderness and has a son, a male child, that is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That is an allusion to the phrase that the Messiah will rule with a rod of iron, the Son of God, in Psalm 2. Now, what we need to do, there are passages in the Old Testament. We talked about Daniel 7. There's Psalm 110, 1, that talks about, My Lord said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. That's an important phrase. That's why Jesus is seated until his enemies are prepared for his defeat. So Jesus is in that position of being seated. We'll, we'll see that numerous times. So we've got Daniel 7, Psalm 110, 1, Psalm 68, which is quoted in Ephesians 4, dealing with the ascension, and then Psalm 2. So we have to put those together uh, to get this, this background, and that will come after I get back from the trip to Egypt. So here her child, that is the, 
Messiah is caught up to God and to his throne. That's why this is another ascension passage to the right hand of God. He's taken to his throne, not to Jesus' throne. That's Revelation 3.21. Jesus says that he will grant to the overcomer that we will sit on his throne in the future, just as he now is seated on his father's throne, not on his throne, not on David's throne, on the father's throne. So those two verses are the two I added this week to that group dealing with the ascension to the right hand of the father. Fourth point is the ascension completes the strategic victory of Christ in the angelic conflict. A strategic victory is one that wins the war. Tactical victories win the battles. But this one wins the war. The first stage was the crucifixion victory over the penalty of sin on the cross when Christ paid the penalty for sin. The second victory is the resurrection over the consequences of sin, physical death. And then third, the ascension, which is victory over Satan and his demonic armies. Because we see that he ascends over the angels and put in authority over all the angels that's fallen as well as elect. So his ascension elevates him as a man to the right hand of the Father, putting him in authority over all principalities and powers. We study that in Ephesians 1, 17 and 18 and other passages. So the fifth point is that the ascension elevates a man to the right hand of God the Father because Jesus as God, the eternal second person of the Trinity, was always in authority over all of the angels. But now it makes a point that he has been elevated to the right hand of the Father and given authority over the principalities and powers. So this is a man who is now at the right hand of the Father who will eventually return as the God-man, emphasis on man, who will rule over the kingdoms of the earth as the king of kings and lord of lords. So Acts 2, 32 and 33, this is what Peter describes in his day of Pentecost sermon. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured forth that which you both see and hear. Going on, he says, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, referring to Psalm 110.1 written by David. This wasn't David when he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's not talking about David. Uh, Acts 2.35 continues the quote from Psalm 110.1, Until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So Christ is not engaged at this point in that battle. It is the Father who is going to make his enemies a footstool, and then he will give the uh, title deed and dominion to the Son. Six, the ascension marks the beginning of Christ's high priestly ministry. He is now our high priest. He is at the right hand of the Father where he is our advocate, 1 John 2, 2, and he makes intercession for us. Hebrews 4, 14 says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, indicating the universe must be finite for him to pass through them and go to heaven on the other side. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Ninth thing we learn is that the ascension demonstrates the manner of Christ's future coming. He will come as he left. He will come with the clouds, and he will come to the earth. So the rapture is not the fulfillment of that. Tenth thing we learn is that with the ascension... Old Testament saints were transferred from paradise in Sheol to heaven. And this is further described, and we'll develop more of this when we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, where it talks about the giving of gifts to men. Eleventh point, Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit to perform the following 
post-salvation ministries in the life of church age believers. So when you save, something happens afterwards. You're baptized by means of the Spirit. You're indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. You will be filled by means of the Spirit when you're walking by the Spirit, and you will receive spiritual gifts. All of that is accomplished because of the ascension of Christ that had to take place. All of this is distinctive and unique to the church age. This is why Paul is writing Ephesians, is to tell us why this is so important and all that ha- these blessings that have been given to us. And then the last point is that the ascension marks the beginning of the waiting period for the kingdom. We're not in it now. It is future. We are waiting until a new people is completed and the Father uh, says it's time and the Son of Man will then come to get the title deed for the earth. And I think that the implication of all of this is that this new people must be removed. And that's the rapture. So all of this implies. And then he will return at the end of the tribulation as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that is the second coming, the bookend to what we're celebrating now as the first coming of the Messiah. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study these things, reflect upon them to gain a greater insight of of your incredible plan that none of this happened by accident, that you had a plan, a purpose, you're working it all out in history, and that right now our Lord is seated, waiting. He is representing us at your right hand as our high priest. He's interceding for us. He's advocating for us. And he is forming his body, the church, in preparation for our future role to rule and reign with him in the kingdom. Father, there's so much here, we're just barely scratching the surface. Help us to understand these things, new ideas for many people, putting it all together, the greatness of your plan, looking forward, anticipating the resolution of it with the church, our rapture, and then returning with the Lord to rule and reign with him. Father, we pray that if there's any who are listening, who've never trusted in Christ as Savior, that this would challenge them to be prepared, to be ready. For we do not know when the end of this age will come. It could come through our, for us through a physical death, or it could come through the rapture. But we need to be prepared. There is life that goes on after death. And the issue is whether we're going to spend that with you or under your wrath. And the scripture says that you have provided everything for us. It's not based on how good we are. It's not based on our own personal efforts, energy, or righteousness, but on the righteousness of Christ. And we receive his righteousness when we trust in him as Savior. And you graciously give that to us so that we may be prepared, clothed properly with his imputed righteousness to be able to spend eternity with you. And we pray that you would open the eyes of those who are not saved to clearly understand this good news, this gospel message. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together to sing our closing hymn number one.